stream anytime, anywhere with the free PBS app. It's considered a masterpiece of mid-century modernism. It remains one of the touchstone homes of the 20th century. So it's easy to forget that the Eames House was born out of a crisis. In May 1945, millions of people celebrate the end of a war in Europe. After World War II, millions of American servicemen came home to discover they had nowhere to live. The GI Bill offered low-cost mortgages, but home builders couldn't put up affordable housing fast enough. They needed housing, and we needed to, as a culture, explore these affordable housing concepts. And so from there, Intenza's idea was born. John Intenza was the publisher of Arts and Architecture magazine. He threw down a challenge to a handful of architects in 1945 to build modern, affordable homes that could be easily replicated. He called it the Case Study House Program. Here we are coming from World War. We have a vast array of industrial components available to us. How can we use these materials and transform them into the modern home? Among the first to accept Intenza's challenge were a husband and wife team who were two of the 20th century's most influential designers. Charles and Ray Eames were the epitome of a Renaissance couple. They excelled at sculpture, filmmaking, graphic design, and architecture. But they're best known for their wildly popular furniture, which proved that mass production and high design could go hand in hand. Their chairs curved to match your back. They used rubber shock joints so that they would flex because we flex. So you could build that sense of what makes us human, which is everything is different, every one of us is unique. The Eames case study house would itself reflect the unique character of its creators. Yet they would build it with factory-made parts that were available to everyone. Everywhere they could employ something that came off the shelf, they did. But their original design looked nothing like this. The Eames planned to build a so-called bridge house that extended over this meadow. But as they waited for their prefabricated parts to arrive, they found themselves picnicking on the spot that would soon be taken over by their home. So they realized in that time that they had made the classic architectural error of choosing a very beautiful site and then destroying it with the building. <laughs> Instead, Charles and Ray took the parts they'd ordered for the bridge house and reconfigured them into a home and studio that nestled gently into the hillside. They had to redesign it to be built from the same pile of parts, and they basically ordered just one extra beam. They basically rearranged these parts like Legos, and that's what you see here. This factory-like approach to home building wasn't new. Sears Roebuck had sold mail-order kit homes. But Charles and Ray Eames were showing how prefabricated materials could solve the nation's housing crisis in style. They wanted homeowners to come. They wanted architects to come. They wanted builders to come and be inspired. The Eames designed the house in a way that shows off all those mass-produced parts. And these windows, I mean, some of them are clear, some of them are frosted, some of them have chicken wire. All these things become a subtle way to add to the texture and the feeling and the experience of being in the house. And this is wood, this panel? Actually, it's not wood. It's a, it's a composite material that came out of the war effort. Even the sliding plastic panels was a material that came out of the war effort, too. And actually, there's another kind of off-the-shelf part, which is the doorbell. And so it's, it's really sort of playful exploration of what standardized parts means. These industrial materials could easily have made this house feel cold and impersonal. Instead, the Eames house is oozing with personality. You get the feeling they had a lot of fun designing this place. They did. And that joy is in every screw and every detail of this house. And they had this expression, take your pleasure seriously, and they lived it. Whereas most modernist architects would have hidden away all their personal possessions, there's a tumbleweed hanging from the ceiling for crying out loud. It's filled with stuff. Well, there are amazing things here. That tumbleweed came from their honeymoon. And what I love about it is there are actually things here that are quite precious. And there are other things you could still get for a nickel wherever they got them. 
And the point is it wasn't about value in that sense. It was really about good stuff. The home of Charles and Ray Eames was one of three dozen case study houses to appear in Arts and Architecture magazine. But its impact rippled far beyond the world of architectural insiders. This house showed Americans that a factory-made home could still feel human. And if they decided to buy one, they wouldn't have to check their individuality at the door. You would still be able to have a great deal of humanity within a framework that was completely machine-made. The Eames has demonstrated that you could build human quirkiness into something that was mass-manufactured.